Hello. My name is Tanya Weidman Davis, and I'm associate professor in the Department of Theater and Dance and of African American Studies program. This afternoon, I welcome you to the African American Studies 50th anniversary faculty conversation series with professors Thaddeus Davis, Dr. B. Brian Boster, and Eto Otetigbe. Thaddeus Davis is the co-artistic director of Weidman Davis Dance and associate professor in the Department of Theater and Dance and African American Studies at the University of South Carolina. Through the lens of the African American experience, he questions notions of spaces and environments that affect the interaction of gender, class, race, technology, and media's ability to shape our perceptions. His research findings are exhibited in the creation of original dance works, films, and essays. Davis has received multiple honors and grants for his work, including National Endowment for the Arts, Art Works Grant, Central Carolina Community Foundation, South Arts Momentum, Alternate Roots Project Development, the National Dance Project Grant, Provost Grant to support the creations of a research team for the development of Migratus ataroxia, MAP Fund Grant to support the research and development of ruptured silence, racist signs and symbols, Jerome Robbins New Essential Works Grant, and Cultural Envoy to Portugal, U.S. State Department. Eto Otetigbe is a polymedia artist whose interdisciplinary practice includes sculpture, performance, installation, and public art. He was a member of the design team for the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers at the University of Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia where he contributed to the creative expression on the memorial's exterior surface. His curatorial projects include directing the SORO Gallery in Jersey City, New Jersey, and co-curating alongside Amanda Kurdahi, the, top, uh, the topophilia exhibition in Nice, Denmark, as part of the ET4U Meetings Festival in Denmark. Otetigbe is an assistant professor in the art department at Brooklyn College. He received a BS in mechanical engineering from MIT, an MS in product design from Stanford University, and an MFA in creative practice from the University of Plymouth. B. Brian Foster, PhD, is a writer and sociologist from Mississippi. He earned his PhD in sociology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and currently works as associate professor of sociology at the University of Virginia. His book, I Don't Like the Blues, Race, Place and the Backbeat of Black Life tells the story of blues development and black community life in the Mississippi Delta town of Clarksdale. Brian, Brian currently serves as co-editor of Sociology of Race and Ethnicity and is working on the collaborative book project entitled Ghost of Segregation with award-winning photographer Rich Frischman. Foster has also directed an award-winning short film and written for a number of outlets, including CNN, Esquire, Ford Foundation, Washington Post, and Veranda. Without further, further ado, and now for our featured conversation. Good afternoon, gentlemen. What's up, yeah? How you doing? How you doing? All right, all right. So I'm going to be better start... than worse. <laughs> I'm just going to start by first thanking you both for uh, participating in this spotlight. Um, we're in our 50th anniversary celebration of African American Studies at the University of South Carolina. And um, faculty uh, in African American studies take an opportunity to be featured. And um, I came across some information that made me think, hmm, I could read something, I could share something that I've done personally, but I've had such wonderful experiences collaborating with both of you. And so I wanted to share the spotlight, shift the light, be in a different space in the light. And I think this gave an opportunity for me to do that. 
So um, I'm going to let you guys open up and dig a little deeper into who you are, and then I'll wrap it up, and then we'll get the questions and start the conversation. Ed, you want to go Ken? first? Yeah, yes. yes. Uh, thank you, Brian. I'd like to start uh, with a land acknowledgement. Um, and I do this because um, currently my, my practice is in visual art, of course, but I'm heavily in public art. I have four public art projects around the United States happening in simultaneity right now. Um, so there is more and more importance that um, I think we should recognize the land and the history, whether positive or um, controversial. So I'd like to read this land acknowledgement. I acknowledge that the lands on which I live and work are the ancestral lands of the Lenin Lenape and Lenape Ho King people whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania and Brooklyn continue to this day. We take this opportunity to honor the original caretakers of this land and recognize the histories of land theft, violence, erasure, and oppression that have brought our institutions and ourselves here. We recognize that many of the practices we draw upon in creating art, design, and scholarship come from the collected wisdom of many indigenous traditions, as well as the traditions of many communities of color, women, queer, and trans people throughout history, whose contributions are often erased. We name this with respect and know that naming, the, naming it alone is not enough. So I invite you, Thaddeus and Brian, to um, acknowledge, or at the very least name, the indigenous uh, people's in the, whose land you reside on. And if folks want to in the chat, name the lands of the indigenous people that they reside on as well, that would be great. Sure, I, I'll <laughs> actually read a, a short paragraph from our from the website of our Office for Equal Opportunity and Civil Rights. Um, so I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and as Tanya mentioned, um, thanks for that introduction, uh, by the way. As Tanya mentioned, I, I work at UVA. And so just a quick note, UVA was designed to educate Southern white gentlemen. It was built by enslaved laborers on Monacan tribal land and enslaved and free black people provided the labor and capital that supported the students and the faculty through the Civil War in the 20th century. University was a pioneer in the eugenics movement and supported segregated schools. The education denied to indigenous nations was publicly acknowledged by what is now recognized as the Commonwealth of Virginia in 2007. So I come to you from Columbia, South Carolina, from the lands of the Catawba, PD, Chilico, Edisto, Santi, and the Congolese people. So let's, let's um, you wanna share some, um, some, some stuff Eto first, and I can share the screen. And uh, sure. Um, okay. Did I uh, share images, or uh, do you have the couple images I sent over? Yeah, hold on. Sorry. All right, if you could just put those up, either either one is fine. And while you do that. <clears throat> So just a little bit of background on me. Um, I'm a visual artist. I'm living and working between Brooklyn, New York and uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And um, I actually took um, a course while I was in grad school called Reciting Sites with um, um, Myron Beasley and Merete Ronstadt. And this was in Berlin, which is a place that is steeped in, in history. And um, especially when we think about how they commemorate um, their history, um, whether it's the Holocaust or um, different things. And uh, it was really amazing to walk around the city and think critically about public art and public memory and its function and how it affects us and how it changes us and how it changes how we relate to places where we live, work, or, or visit. So um, since that time, I've had this you know, desire to work in public space because it's kind of removed from the gallery setting or the museum setting that has its own politics um, as well as far as how comfortable, you know, folks feel in those spaces and how inviting and inclusive those spaces are uh, for their visitors and also for their programming and, and the artists work who, who they showcase there. Whereas in public space, you know, those, we see some of those politics as well, but um, they play out a little differently. 
And um, the images we're showing here are kind of the spectrum of how I'm working. You know, the, um, this image we're looking at is why I'm in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania right now. <clears throat> and it's a public art commission at the Amy Gutman Hall, which is a new data science building that will be erected in uh, 2023, 2024. And um, I'm uh, placing a large scale uh, public artwork that's about 67 feet by 30, by uh, 13 or 14 feet on the exterior of um, this building. It's uh, layers of stone, steel, and interactive LEDs. Um, each layer is speaking to collective health and well being, data equity and um, environmental sustainability. Then uh, the other image we see there is what I'm thinking about the, the other side of my practice, the kind of improvised and, you know, talking with Thaddeus all the time about improvisation as a movement artist. How do visual artists improvise? How is it possible that I could improvise with something that's so static, you know, this being a municipal swimming pool in Austin, Texas, that's been decommissioned for years was adjacent to the George Washington Carver Museum in Austin, Texas, where I had an exhibition. And I decided as a form of performance and intervention to paint this graphic in the swimming pool and stage a performance of music and capoeira improvisation. Um, so kind of, you know, re real different or dynamic or, or polymedia or polytextural ways that I use to affect public space. So Brian, you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm unmuted. Um, so I grew up in in a small town in Northeast Mississippi. Uh, I live right next door to my grandparents, both of whom um, spent a lot of their lives sharecropping. And um, I grew up with my dad, who's also from that same small town in Northeast Mississippi, and my mom, who's from another small town, um, about an hour north. Of, of of Shannon, that town that, that I say I grew up in. And um, really from, I won't say from an early age, but I was, I was somewhat young when I realized that being where I'm from, um, Mississippi, and being marked in a way, my body being marked in the way that it was marked, that actually sounds a little bad to, given what I'm referencing, being a black boy from Mississippi meant something. It meant something for how people perceived me, for how people would treat me. I spent some time um, right after high school in Minnesota at a small liberal arts school, I learned, learning that being a black boy from Mississippi meant something for how, what people thought of me um, and for how they would treat me. I somehow wound up in 2011 um, in the sociology doctoral program at UNC Chapel Hill. I say somehow. I worked my ass off. I read, I was a, a voracious reader. I was a writer. Uh, my parents and grandparents and community, um, you know, show love and, and, and provided as much as they could resources that in 2011, um, you know, pushed, pushed me or, or located me at, um, at UNC Chapel Hill. And it was in those early years, thinking that I was an education scholar, reading about the experiences of kids in schools in Boston and DC and Philly and Baltimore and Chicago and in California. It was then when I realized that while so many people seem to have a lot of thoughts about folks like me, black boys from Mississippi, there were not a lot of stories about folks like me in um, the literature as it were. And so like that was kind of the starting point for the work that I do, uh, which is documenting uh, the stories of, of communities of black communities in the rural South, uh, communities like the one that that raised and loved on me. Uh, and so I've spent some time in the last, I guess it's been 11 years now, since 2011, um, including some of my time at Chapel Hill. Um, I'm an ethnographer, which means I spend like my, my sort of method of uh, expertise is, is really like talking to people and listening to people and watching what people do and seeing how all of those things, what people say and what they do and so forth, like how they line up. Um, but I'm also deeply interested in place. And so like the stories that places tell. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Southern hip hop fan. And, and so there's there's this line that you'll hear from any number of, of rappers, whether it's Wayne or Yo Gotti, women lie, men lie, we might uh, amend it now. Women lie, men lie, people lie, but a lot of times places don't. And so that kind of is the motivating kind of impetus for um, the academic work that I do, 
Uh, I am the co-editor of Sociology of Race and Ethnicity, the preeminent journal for scholarship on race and ethnicity and sociology. Uh, our, one of our areas of emphasis, um, I work with, with JT Thomas, who's at the University of Mississippi. One of our areas of emphasis is place. Um, and so this interest in place um, kind of presents itself in, in the academic work that I do, in the, in the storytelling work that I do. So um, Tanya mentioned the book, I Don't Like the Booze, Race, Place, and the Backbeat of Black Life. It's me uh, sort of reflecting on and theorizing about five years of, of field work in the Mississippi Delta. Um, I'm increasingly into visual storytelling work. This is what um, brought Tanya and Thaddeus and I together last year. Um, and there are other, you know, I do, I do some oral history work down in Mississippi and increasingly um, or eventually um, up this well, further this way in Virginia. And again, you know, it's, it's, it's stories, it's research questions, it's, um, it's artistic and creative work around questions of race, um, around questions of inequality and resilience and culture, um, but all, all underwritten by this interest in place. Thank you. So I'm Thaddeus Davis, and um, I'm an associate professor at the University of South Carolina in theater and dance and African American studies. Um, my practice is dance, dance making, dance conversations, dance studies, anything that has to do with movement, the Middle Passage, the Great Migration, anything where movement is involved, I'm interested. Um, and my journey is from Montgomery, Alabama and having left Montgomery, Alabama at 18 and had at that time put the South behind me with no intentions of returning. And some 2009, I think it was, I found myself in Columbia, South Carolina. And here I am uh, with all my sophistication and world travel and I'm back in the South. But something funny is different now. <laughs> it's funny, it's funny how it works. Uh, and then that thing about place as you spoke about Brian comes back because I'm back in the South and I'm back learning myself again with a new set of eyes. Um, and I'm gonna share something that's, um, you know, we've been working, I've had the pleasure of working with both of you, uh, most recently a film with, with Brian and Brian and uh, Ethan Payne, and a few years ago, two, a year and a half ago on um, Migratus Ataraxia and many other projects with Eto. So I know you personally, so I'm just gonna share this, uh, this situation here to talk about the project. So I have a collaborative partner, Tanya Whiteman Davis and I are in full collaboration on our art making where we, are, we uh, direct Whiteman Davis Dance. Um, and this is our project that we just got funded for. Um, and it does exactly what Brian shared. It's a look at, and I'll just let it play. It's a look at a space, a place from a different angle. And what can we learn when we take the, the celebrity out of it and we deal with the everyday people that are in that space? What stories can we learn through conversations? What can we know about a thing when we just happen to glance at it from a different view? What's obvious when we look at the other side of a, something that we all know, that we're very familiar with? The Edmund Pettus Bridge, but from a different angle. And so in Selma, Alabama, we started a project, we just got funded for this project and we'll start this project here in the next couple of days. Um, and this project is to premiere in Selma next fall. And it's really taken an opportunity to look at the foot soldiers of the civil rights movement, not the famous people, Martin Luther King or any other, other famous names that we know about, that we're familiar with, but the foot soldiers, the people that we don't know who were significant and were the most important reason why the march was successful because they turned out and sacrificed their livelihoods. So this project is to create a dance work, a theater work, art installation along a pathway downtown in Selma, sort of lifting up and celebrating these black lives. Um, so with that in mind, I'm just gonna go a little bit further and give a little information about how this came to be, this conversation. So in a campus climate survey that I was given um, by Professor Todd Shaw, who's one of the 
2% that we'll be talking about. Um, I learned that as an African-American man in the College of Arts and Sciences at University of South Carolina, I am 2%. And it came to me like, well, wow, I know all 2% of the black men that are in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I thought that was the strangest thing. I shared it with, with you, Brian, and Brian was like, oh no, I got some harder data. And you gave me the national data that said that African-American men are 3% at PWIs, predominantly white institutions. And here in South Carolina, African-American women are 3%. And so that caused me to think about, well, can we be in a conversation across institutions about those sorts of things and, 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 and where we find ourselves and our responsibility if we have a responsibility? So that's one thought. And the second thought was in December, Bell Hooks passed. And when Bell Hooks passed, I quickly went to my bookshelf and was just like, put my hand on so many books of hers that had influenced me and had changed how I thought about my existence um, and started wanting to hear her words again and figure out, well, what was it so, why was it so important for me to have her in my ethos? And so I picked up uh, Art on My Mind, uh, political, visual politi politics. And in visual politics, there's an article that she wrote entitled, In Our Glory, Photography and Black Life. And there's a quote that I'm gonna um, um, reference now. She says, unlike photographs constructed so that black images would appear as the embodiment of colonizing fantasies, the snapshots gave us a way to see ourselves, a sense of how we looked when we were not wearing the mask when we were not attempting to perfect the image for a white supremacist gaze. And as we've talked about before, I've, I've, I've talked with both of you, I, I come with the question of, well, who are we as black male faculty in these predominantly white institutions? Um, what are our responsibilities if we have any? Do we wear the mask? When we are not, when are we not behind the mask? So I just wanna open it up, you know, what 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 is our responsibility? Do we have one? Um, I I definitely think we do. Um, as educators, first, you know, we have a responsibility to um, uphold equity, um, support diversity, foster inclusion, um, promote excellence and best practices. That's something, I don't care who you are, where you're from or what you look like or what kind of shoes you wear. As an educator, you should be doing all those things, right? You know, and then I think for us as um, a faculty of color in institutions where we are a minority, um, it's a, it takes a little bit of extra work to do those very things. Um, it takes some invisible work to do those very things um, because at times we may be having to be educators to our colleagues, whether they're in faculty or administration about how doing those things um, is important. And there might be nuanced ways in which we can accomplish some of those um, agendas that um, require negotiation and conversations, you know, that kind of go beyond what, you know, we were normally contracted to do, you know, right, as um, faculty members. So um, it's, it's, it's a layered task, you know, and yeah. Yeah, I, so I've got a couple of thoughts, one on this like question of responsibility, and then I want to go back to this like language and idea of like wearing the mask. So, so first, I, I like many of my thoughts about uh, the responsibilities that I think that um, black male faculty carry, I think they reflect a lot of what of what you just said, Ethel. And I, I also think about responsibility in a slightly different way. Like I feel, and maybe it's for better or worse, like I feel like a deep and, and irreducible responsibility to like my grandma and grandparents and community. And then on the side of like on the university side, like to students and in particular students who look like me, black students who come from when I was in Mississippi, primarily come from, you know, underfunded, under-resourced schools across the state. Um, students whose stories sound a lot like mine and whose voices sound a lot like mine. I, I, I for, for better or worse, I don't, you know, sometimes it feels 
um, empowering and and um, inspiring to to be entrusted to um, to teach and, and commune with with students um, from from particular types of backgrounds. Sometimes it feels maybe like a burden, um, but I think a lot of you know to the extent that I, to the extent that I've um, you know I don't have a, I don't have a history of um, like being an agitator, so to speak, on, on the on the university spaces in the university spaces that that I, that I've worked in. Uh, but to the extent that folks like have looked at me in in a way that is like unapproving, it's always because my responsibility first is to the people, is to them students, is to the folk, is to the community that produced me, um, and that is irrespective of the position that I hold in university spaces. Um, and so I like I could talk more about that and ramble more about that. But that's another way that I think about responsibility is it's like to those folks. Um, you know, anyway, I could I could say what I just said again, but I, I actually wanted to get back to the to the wearing the mask kind of idea. And you know, I think I think on one hand about all of the folks who like who taught me how to wear the mask, so to speak. Like my grandmother, and forgive me, I'm thinking a lot about her for a lot of different reasons. Um, but like my grandmother, like what you think they make belt loops for? That's what she would often say about like when I'm getting ready to go to church and she's gonna take me and I don't and I got on my slacks and my button up, but I don't have a belt. And and she would always make sure that my button, like when I button up the, you know, my my shirt, it wasn't, you know how like you miss a button and it's like cricket when you um, or how my mother, my mama like talk like this, not like that. Like so many different, um, so many of the folks. Uh, growing up who I might think about as like training me, teaching me how to wear a mask and how after crossing over, so to speak. Um, and, and for me, once grad school became uh, like a, a, not just a possibility and aspiration, but a reality, how so many folks, Deirdre Cooper Owens, Andrew Robinson, I could keep going, like had to do the work of, or had to, maybe that's the wrong language, of like untraining that. Of like, yeah, so you know how, you know, you know how you are supposed to, you know how, and you know, so much of what our parents and grandparents and communities teach us, it's about safety, it's about protecting us. Um, and then, and then sort of when you get to the grad school space, um, there's just like those, like some of those same things, like the same thing that'll make you laugh and make you cry, like can be de debilitating. And I just remember how so many of my mentors, um, and I don't think it's happenstance that everybody I've named so far is a black woman, how so many of my mentors uh, poured into me and made me feel comfortable and safe, kind of step into the side of the mask sometime with the, with the hope perhaps that in time I would learn that like the mask, maybe I can leave it you know, I can completely leave it behind. So those are just some thoughts both about this idea of responsibility um, and also about, and I mean, just, I'll say one other thing, just more specifically about Bell Hooks. I remember I was a senior at the University of Mississippi. Um, I was taking a class with, with Dr. Jesse Scott, rest in peace, um, and listening to folks like Xandria Robinson, who I've mentioned, and Deirdre Cooper Owens, how I mentioned, uh, who I've mentioned, and um, and we real cool. That's the first, that was my introduction to that book. It was, that was my first introduction to, to Bell Hooks and also like to, and I don't know if I had the language then, but like to this different way of thinking about love and gentleness and, um, and like community and, and like connection between folks and like this warm and intimate way. I don't know if I really understood or knew what to do with those ideas then. But I definitely knew, I definitely knew that like, this feels different than some of the other stuff that I've read, some of the other ideas that, I'm, that I've been grappling with. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, I, you know, when I left Alabama in whatever year that was at 19 and moved to Indiana to go to school and then from there going to New York, like I doubled down on the mask <laughs> because I was this kid from Alabama who had this Southern dialect, first of all, and I, I just had all the southernness stuff to me that like people instantly saying, well, you talk funny, you know, and all of that was a part of what do you mean I talk funny? I'm cool where I'm from in Alabama. I'm cool. I'm at the top of the, of the heap in the sense of coolness with all the people there. And all of a sudden I get here and then I start to travel around the world and people go, well, I don't I don't understand you. And, and then these other dialects come into play and it's like, well. I don't even speak the basic English from America. I speak Southern English and they definitely don't understand it. So I had to double down on the mask got bigger. 
And so then coming back to South Carolina was like, oh, there's some pieces of me that I put to the side in order to gain access to this world of international travel as a dance artist. And so I shared this with Eto last night, you know, to be in front of a group of students just last week and to go from demonization to celebration in our conversation about the Super Bowl halftime show, it's like from demonization right down the street when it was the Crips and the Blood to we're just celebrating this culture that's developed, Black culture, right here at the halftime show and to be in front of African-American students and white students and have this in-depth conversation that Tanya and I are able to bounce around the room and not feel like we have to, we can just hit on hit and miss and fill in a few gaps that they miss is a real opportunity to take that mask off because now we're talking about something that is, is central for us both, this idea of black culture. So that black culture for me has the expression and that finding the freedom to be able to express my version of Southern existence as it has moved about and come back to the South is that opportunity for me to take that mask and go, yeah, I, I need to put this over to the side and not what is called code switch, like stop that and take the thing and put it over there and just let it sit over there because you're established enough, you're smart enough, you've done enough work to be able to transcend and jump around in the different communities. And it doesn't have to be a mask as much as it once had to be. Yeah. And so I see, I see your, <laughs> your mind percolating. A little light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> I see it, I see it. A little bit of color spinning. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, thinking about this mask, I think um, I've been in this really unique or odd opportunity, right? Uh, as a result of my birth, I'm an American African. My parents were Nigerian um, exchange students, essentially. Uh, they came to this country, and I was born, you know, while they were in graduate school in, in Buffalo, New York. <laughs> of all places um and then you know they went back to nigeria to do uh service for government as, as teachers and then they came back and built their lives here so i have siblings born between nigeria <clears throat> and the united states so i've always been in a lot of ways an odd one in, in in the sense that you know i lived in the midwest massachusetts and upstate new york and never really fitting in the skater kids or you know the um the basketball kids or you know um so i just got used to that being odd and not really relying on a mask and just having to sort of perhaps articulate more who i am or what i'm doing or, or what i'm about um you know and then i studied engineering and worked as an engineer for some time um while i was still you know creating art um, and I just gravitated more and more towards art because what I saw in engineering, although there's these opportunities for innovation and, and a lot of amazing things to happen, I think you have to be a lot more strategic about how you do code switch and, you know, face change and, you know, do all those things. Whereas in art, this, I saw that there was a lot more freedom to operate. Um, so I just really embraced that space and, and what was possible in it. Um, and uh, in, in the, is the further and further I get into academia, which was not my intention, actually. Um, Mine either. Of, <laughs> <laughs> Mine either. But I am. Yeah, I, I, mean, I love it. You know, a series yes. of opportunities made the way for me to um, get this position I have, and I, I really embraced it. You know, I went in and kind of did an assessment of, you know, the, the sculpture area, which is what I was hired to do. And I just kind of changed it. You know, I said, well, you know, thinking about what practice in the field looks like now and what I hope, you know, it looks like, you know, five, 10 years from now, what, what should education look like, you know? So I um, created new courses and brought in new instructors and brought in new tools and things like that to, to the department. And um, in doing all that, I just um, made sure that I was always myself doing it. And I was very clear um, in, in my intentions and clear in what I felt was wrong and um, where, where the gaps were. And I, I think that, you know, I do have the luxury 
of perhaps being in an art department that is, you know, pretty supportive of what I'm doing. I know that not all faculty members have that luxury. And I think another luxury I have, I didn't really know what this meant, is that, um, um, you know, I'm in Brooklyn College. So I, I think it's like a scrappy little city school. It's almost like the, the Wu-Tang of art school. <laughs> this is a joke, I say. And, um, we have the benefit of having one of the most diverse student bodies in the country. I mean, it's it's, it's amazingly diverse. And faculty, no, we're so on par with the metrics that Brian shared with us <laughs> as far as two and three percent faculty of color. But the student body is really diverse, which is very different from um, my experience as, as a student, um, where uh, both the faculty in the institutions I went to, both the faculty and the student body were in extreme minority numbers. Yeah, you know, that's you, you know, when you speak about diverse student population, you know, when I went to Butler University and those thoughts never entered my mind because it was a different time. So it was late 80s, early 90s. I graduated in 93 in undergrad. And so I was going there. I'd been sit, sent there by Diane Robinson, who, you know, was, a, was and is a celebrated dancer in her own right, who landed, who came back to Tuskegee, Alabama. And so when I went to Butler, it was less than... 2%. There was like two of us out of 70 kids. So, you know, the diver I went there to get what they had. So the idea of diversity wasn't even a, a conversation. It's as you say, like, I'm here to get this information. And I know I'm, a, I'm, I'm different, but I put myself on hold so I can get this information so I can move to the next space. Um, and so, yeah, that's interesting thinking about that. Yeah, I, I just, just a quick, like, I'm, I'm thinking about my own um, like all those years at Ole Miss and then now at UVA, how the classroom space for me, I think now the classroom space is one of the freest, like I'm, I feel the freest to do and be how I do and be when I'm in the classroom. I don't know, I'm, I'm just trying to remember now, I mean, it ain't that long ago, five or six years ago, but I'm trying to remember my earliest, like those early, I remember the classroom space being so, like terrifying, maybe that's overstating it a little bit, but I think both in terms of practically, like, am I providing these young people um, like with what is you, with, with, with ideas and frameworks and so forth that are useful. Um, but then also like there is this, for me early on, there was, I won't call it an obsession, but like this deep attention to how I'm presenting myself. Um, whether it's how I'm dressing or how I'm talking or the metaphors and examples that I use. Um, and I feel so, so, so much freer now such that like if I could go back all that long ago, five, six years ago and talk to my younger self, like there I would, you know, the, the, the message that this version of, of, of me would deliver would be just would be so different than what my perspective was then. I wonder for y'all if there's like a like a similar like backward looking uh, perspective that you have now about whether it's, you know, how you are presenting yourself in the classroom space or otherwise, just in the, in the academy more generally, now that you have experiences, now that you, you know, you've, this ain't your first or second time around the block, so to speak, I wonder if like there's a perspective that you have now that you would offer to like your younger self that, that would highlight maybe some interesting differences or illustrative differences, um, you know, in, in the experience of being, um, and I don't want this to sound like too like talented, tenth, exceptional, it's just a basic <laughs> quantitative fact of like of being a part of that, you know, 3%. Yeah, for me, you know, it's like learning that it's a process, mm -hmm. you know, to go from like, to go from spending, 15 hours a day on the physical practice to going from that studio teaching physical practice to delving into dance studies to take that and to go into teaching art and culture, African-American art and culture and developing a specific perspective on it through movement practices, that it's a process that evolves and you don't go and you don't get the encyclopedia, read it all, then go regurgitate it. <laughs> You know, and so that practice of evolving lets me feel more comfortable to improv. And also 
particularly for like um 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 uh there's a, a a film we show, and I get nervous every time we show it. I tell you, that I've shown it two times together in a course, and it's called um, oh gosh, um, Slade. Oh gosh, I have to get the woman's name. But it's a traumatizing film for me to watch, and I get nervous because I'm like, can I care for these students as they view it? And I think I've done we've done it three times, and this year was the first time I sat because I sat in the audience with them. I did not stand in front of them. I sat with them and I watched it and I felt totally different. And I felt like, ah, uh, I've seen it enough and I know how difficult it can be to process slave slave trauma, traumatic slave trauma. And, and I know what these difficult conversations are, but now I'm able to go in them and feel like I have enough experience to care for them differently. Um, and so I think for me, the biggest thing is that it's been a process. It's been a process. Post-traumatic slave syndrome, that's what it is, by um, Joy DeGruy, that's what it is. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, for me, yeah, I, I totally agree with Thaddeus that's a, that it's a process. And I know that just, if I just think about my process personally, there were a lot of transitions that happened when I uh, went into academia, just uh, professionally and career-wise, the nature of my work changed drastically from kind of essentially doing like gig kind of work and freelance and working with lots of different folks and traveling around, um, but still doing a lot of that for my own studio, as opposed to having lots of other folks I'm working with and, and working with the, with the college. Um, I also became a, a, a new father two times over <laughs> so, <laughs> since I started working with two, two young, beautiful Black boys. Um, so that is really interesting and life-changing experience. And it, so the, the whole, what I really got from this whole process, or, or maybe two or three things, if I could boil it down, is number one, time is just critical. And I think... You know, as we mentioned, um, we are tasked as faculty of color, we are tasked with a lot. Um, and I think it's really important for us, for me to really watch how my time is used and, and how I allocate it, you know? And, and, and basically, Brian, to kind of piggyback off what you're saying, what I find is that I feel like I'm most powerful and most effective and most useful to the students whether it's directly um, working with them on projects um, uh, in independent studies or office hours or just, you know, conversations I have, you know, walking on campus and I bump into them. Those, some of those five minute conversations could be teaching and learning moments for both of us, right? Mm -hmm. And they could just kind of help us, you know, um, get through the day. But also in the classroom as well. Um, thinking about how that space is really a dynamic space, a safe space, a place. I always tell my students this is a place for us to get out of our own way. Um, so, you know, thinking about that film you're sharing, Thaddeus, it's, it's, um, it seems like it's really jarring, but maybe it's the kind of thing that kind of helps us get out of our own way and, and disrupt the space and feel unsettled. But in, in doing that, maybe uh, other things come into view for us and we're able to grow and, and flourish and create in different ways and challenge ourselves. And um, I think at the beginning, uh, I was contending a lot with the administration in, in different ways, you know, because I kind of came in wanting to implement a lot of things quickly. <laughs> and I don't think academia works like that at all. <laughs> you mean so you I, mean quickly? <laughs> the quickly, especially. <laughs> so um, I think I I, may, I might have. Um, told my my younger self to maybe prioritize some of those things and, and spread them out in a different way, thinking about time allocation as well. So that, you know, my, my time in that classroom and my time with, with the students is, is, is optimal, you know. One thing I'll add, I'll add to that, like, I, I realized at some point, maybe four or five years ago that, and this is before getting this climate report, but I began to talk to students and go, oh gosh, students of color, we're both in this thing in the same level. 
It's not like there's a bunch of you here at this institution that makes you feel different than the spaces that I feel when I feel uncomfortable. So when we see each other, like just walking and they see you, it's just like, what you doing? What, who are you? What, what, you look different. You look, you may be teaching something around here. Whose classes do you teach? Like, so that kind of interaction with the walking along campus has really helped me go, wow, I see that they need me like I need them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I want to jump in right here. I think yeah. this is such a like crucial um, and and I don't know, like unfortunate reality. Like I'm I'm entrusted with y'all. I'm expected to deliver something to y'all in this space. I'm expected to offer something to y'all in this space. But like j and like just like y'all, I'm trying to survive it, too. Like this thing is traumatizing me too. Um, and that's such a, I think, I feel like that's such, and it's not a unique experience to black men, but you know, this is who it's, this, you know, we talking to each other. Um, right. Like I think that's something that is not acknowledged or recognized even by us, even by me. Like, you know, I want to do and be as much as I can do and be for students in it because of what I know, like, because I know this place can't offer it because I know this place, whether it's Ole Miss or UVA or wherever, don't recognize them in different ways or don't offer to them the things that they need beyond, you know, the title that they carry as students. Um, I'm expected to be and do, but also like this thing is a boogeyman to me too. And like, mm -hmm. that's a that's a, a really particular type of challenge. That is, I really appreciate the, um, like the process point seems straightforward, but I it's, it's really rich, especially like that, that, this ain't an encyclopedia point mm -hmm. because I feel like at least in the social sciences and I will talk about my experience at Chapel Hill. So I don't, whether this is like objectively if folks look like did an audit of the curriculum and so forth that this, this would be a part of the conclusion. I don't know. My experience was of Chapel Hill though was, was the, the practice of sociology, the, the um, responsibilities of being a faculty person on campus, the responsibilities of being a part of the academy, all are treated as like encyclopedic information. Mm -hmm. Read all the books, go to all the seminars. When you get the PhD, you now know. And it's actually like when you, once you get the PhD and you heavy, heavy air quotes now know, it's really like, it can be, it can actually be terrifying when you realize, oh, this is a process. Uh, and a long one. It's like, I know some stuff. I've read some stuff. But like, okay, now I'm in class. Or now I'm in the meeting with this student. And he like, and he didn't ask me something about my grandmother. Did my grandmother teach me to hate white people? Like, <laughs> you, you didn't see didn't really, like, when, I must have missed the page in the encyclopedia with how to deal with this. Or, or, right, when you feel like, damn, that lecture was inadequate. Or yeah. damn, what I offered that student or was not enough. Excuse me. And so, like that process point, I just think, as, and, and I'll speak from from someone who went to a research focused PhD program, and right after that, I was on the tenure track and so forth. Um, it's a lesson that can that can be learned like that hard way. Um, and at least you know, maybe I'm the only one that was like that. But for me, it was a lesson that came that came tough. Wow. So Tanya wants to, as the moderator, she wants us to open this up for questions now. I mean, we could go on, we could go on, we can go on. We only have one hour, which is so not enough time for our conversation because there's so many more. I, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> questions. So we'll open up for questions, but I mean, I just have one question because, you know, Eto, you, Eto, you brought in the conversation about time. And I'm just thinking about like white time and black time in the academy. And we want change quickly because so much isn't working. And for so many people, it's not working. So how that, like how we're in these PWIs and how we're dealing with time and how we want to see it happen quickly. I, so I, I've got, to, I got, I got a quick thought. Like it, this is a, a, the like the white time, black time thing is so, like, it can be funny, right? CP time and, and, and that sort of thing. <laughs> but, but like in a, in a, in a slightly more serious way, it's really funny how when it comes to matters of structural change, when it comes to matter of matters of addressing the concerns of faculty and staff and students of color, time takes long, but when it's time for a task force, 
when it's a search <laughs> committee, when there's something that you need to offer because of your black body, you know, we need to check the box. Like, it seems like time, seems, it, it, it like hits different. Or if you need some funding to go do this, um, or if you need some institutional support to apply for that, like time hit different. And I think, you know, it's a- Or you need a, a document. That document, has, you, it, it comes up just like need. out of nowhere. <laughs> but it, it gets to what you're saying, Tanya, this, the urgency, like we, we, we arrive in these spaces and we're like, this is urgent. There is an immediate need to yeah. change this, to break that down, bring this in and, um, you know, give the students the best quality education that they, that we can offer. And, um, that urgency is not always shared. And, and I think, you know, as Brian is saying, we find that frustrating, yeah. you know, to have to work through that, work with that, you know? And what I think, as, and for me, what it has done is it, 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 because we go and we make something, and I say this and people probably get tired of me saying it, but we create something that didn't exist before we started. There was, there was something in the room there was energies in the room and we figure out how to navigate and manage and put them in certain orders to make a legible idea come forth called a dance or a theater piece. And so there's an urgency to get through the thing to get to the end of the performance because you got a deadline. And that's not how change particularly happens as far as curricular, as far as all those things that we deal with in the academy and, be, and being an artist, and being an artist of color, it's like, well, you know, I only got so long I can do this because I this this funding source is I only got a little bit of money, so I can't work forever because I got to pay people. So I have a limited amount of hours, and I got to get it done because they, that's all the time I got. After that, I run out of money, and I have no more no more funding to be able to do it. So John Dozier put it in the in the, in the chat. Well said. Time, support, and funding, and that's how these things get changed or not changed. Lack of or overabundance of. Mm -hmm. So there are no other questions that oh. I see thus far, but I'm gonna ask my own then. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so I was thinking about, you know, the interest of place that, you know, we all have. So from the lens of dance, public art, sociology, and, you know, we're all centered on being these black marked bodies doing this work. So what is the visibility or amplification you want to bring forth in your work? What do you want to make visible? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go because I got my mission statement is it's literally to put as many stories of the rural Black South, the people, the communities, the art that we produce, the political traditions that we created and added to, and I can keep going, is to put as many of those stories on the record as possible. So that when at some point um, the next person finds their way from rural Mississippi to Chapel Hill or Stanford or U Chicago or wherever, and they are looking for their, they're looking for themselves, they're looking for their stories, there's something to be found. Um, I ain't the first, I ain't the best, I won't be the last. Uh, but for me, it's, it's, it's filling the archives with as many different, with the short film, with an oral history collection, with the book, with the research article, with the public presentation, whatever, is putting those stories on the record so that they are on the record. Um, and, 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 and I think the visibility piece or, or like one of the hope for outcomes in terms of, um, you know, how that work is received, I just want people to know. Like mm -hmm. Mississippi isn't an artifact. The rural South isn't an artifact. It's a living and breathing and dynamic and ravaged back to keep going thing. And so that's how I think about my work, which, you know, for me, place means, I think without exception, like the rural American South. I think um, me, I think I have two primary agendas. One is, um, I'm actually glad John Dozer was on the call. If that's the same John Dozer from MIT, yeah, yes. what I learned it is. from all right, what I learned from MIT was that, um, and the reason I went there when I was young was that it was a space where I could play, and there was infinite it seemed resources. They even have an infinite corridor, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I it that opened up so many opportunities for me. So. Um, 
and I and I want to provide access in that way um, to to art students. I want to provide them access to technology, to tools, to spaces to create, to conversations, to other artists, to other opportunities, um, so that they can sort sort of bring their own stories, bring their own background, bring their own histories um, to the table, and, and expand on um, you know the language and the stories and the content that's out in the field. So that's kind of public facing and then more um kind of in this quiet way and Thaddeus tells me I work in this quiet way and I think that more recently I've been um looking and been working on projects related to data science and algorithms and things of that nature and even in there what we see is that um depending on who's authoring these algorithms and even when we talk about artificial intelligence they, they start with an author in, in, in many ways and then there's learning and training and things and iteration and generation that happens beyond there, but there are underlying assumptions um, that these things begin with. And at times those underlying assumptions could um, be um, exclusive and they could be discriminatory. So um, how, how can we hack the algorithms? How can we um, provide uh, more equity in authorship and, and agency in, in these things that are um, really ubiquitous in our lives. So I think that, you know, for, for me, um, when Tanya and I started Weidman Davis Dance, our mission at that time, our mission statement, which I still stand on, though it's morphed and changed, was dance as the central focus, but not the sole focus. And so that dance can be a lot of things and we can use dance in a lot of conversations. And the dancing is not just the physical body, but dancing is this conversation we're having now as we dance words around these different screens and movement practices. And then also, in, 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 as coming back to the South, it's the exact same thing you're talking about, Brian. Like, how can I be back with the people that raised me? How can I be back in Montgomery, Alabama? How can I be back at Mount Gila Baptist Church with them old ladies? With that funny smell and the old wood from the heavy breathing. And the, how can I be back in the spaces where it was nurturing stuff going on that I can't reproduce in other spaces? And so it's not particularly rural, rural South, but it is South. Regardless of where I end up in the next 50 years all over the world, I'm realizing that I'm from the South and I am a Southerner. And so my practice or whatever I'm interested in is about how do we lift those voices and you know, just think about those people that made it possible for me, many other people like me to move forward with that mask and take that mask off and exist? Yeah, I think the last thing that maybe we could talk about is, so I think we're all doing this kind of work where we're commemorating people, but how intimate that work is and how nuanced it is. So can the three of you speak about that? It's about place, but we're really kind of utilizing place to center people. I, I think, you know, we say, we say something in the film that, that we did, uh, Brian, memory is a place. Like we say, you say so memory. Uh -huh. And so as I think about that, I mean, I think Tanya says that in her dialogue, but like, as I think about that idea of like the intimacy, I'm constantly calling my mother at this point because I can, yeah. you know, like there's such a, I'll go back to my church roots, though I'm not practicing any religion now, but it's a blessing to be able to pick the phone up. And I, I called my mother a couple of days ago and I said, um, do you know where um, somewhere is? She goes, it's yep. out there. And then I said, no, way. I said, you must have known where it was as a child because you used to always say to me, well, go sit down somewhere. So I knew <laughs> you must have known where somewhere was. <laughs> you know, so, but I call her. She's, why you call me with that silly stuff? I just call you because I remember things about my childhood that are touching me and bubbling up in me. And I want everyone to be able to take personal existence and put it in their art making practice and let it bubble up in them as well be it the students I work with or the yeah. people that I collaborate. And I think I've, I've 
particularly have had that experience with both of you where talking to you about family and it bubbles over into our art making collaboration together. So I ditto, ditto and well said to all of that. Another way that I think about um, kind of this uh, attention that we all and, you know, that I pay uh, to, to people and relationships and, and community, like as a sociologist, I think that I think that a community of black folks in Northeast Mississippi producing a black boy that's now a tenured professor, and this ain't no talented tip, whatever. Like I know how it sounds, but producing a black boy that's a tenured professor at UVA, to me, that is like, let's go learn about all of the practices, the 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 parenting, the the cultural traditions, the so forth and so on. Like, let's go learn what was happening there. That, like, there's something that's happening in that place that is instructive about human life in the world that we live in. In the Mississippi Delta, the place that gave us the blues, a place that was once known as the poorest, most deprived, so forth, resource deprived place in the world. One of the more, one of the more, um, like one of the poorest places in the developed world. It's still people there, like living and going to church on Sunday and still producing culture that people want to, like they love it so much that they want to emulate it, but they can't even emulate it. That's something that that is worth learning about. Um, and so for me, the focus on, or like the way that people and relationships and community take center stage, um, you know, it's about these really, you know, I can't talk about my family a lot without getting overcome with emotion. Um, and so like, there's a part of that that is there, a big part of that that is there. Um, I also think that like what black folks are doing, what black families are doing, what black communities are doing, what Southern families and communities are doing can teach us something about ourselves um, and make us move toward being better versions of ourselves. So for me, I think it's, you know, the, the sociologist in me is always looking for the general in the particular. And I think it's a lot of general in the particular of, of the rural South. I think um, for me, when I think about um, space, place and space, um, there's this arc I could talk about um, working with you, Thaddeus and Tanya and at UT Austin. And we, we've done actually a lot of work on um, racist uh, symbols in, in public space. And I remember we worked together at UT Austin when they still had Confederate statues in this large green lawn. and. I remember you two, we, we, we walked around this, this green area and you all, you looked at these statues, these fixed stone monuments and the stance they had, they had the, a sword or something or a rifle at their hilt or, or their waist. And then you, we went into the studio and you took that stance and you transformed it into movement phrases. And then we intervened on the campus in, in different ways with those movement phrases and, um, some folks uh, knew what was happening. Uh, they were aware of the performance and why we were doing it. Some were not, you know, but what I loved is that um, we were able to disrupt a space, you know, that was charged with so much hate and, and negativity, right? And I think that that happens in, in other ways here in Philadelphia, of course, at, um, at University of Pennsylvania, one of the most prominent recent public artworks on their campus is Simone Lee's Brick House. I mean, it's standing right there, looking right at you in a really prominent location. So what I love about that, again, is this idea of disruption and transformation of space. And um, uh, for us as, as Black folks, an, an, an acknowledgement of um, a black presence in space, and you know, can can is can that space be safe for us? Um, is a question that's always you know um, at the forefront of our minds when we're moving through just about any space as people of color in this country. But I think that the more opportunities we have to in intervene on space in different ways, whether it's through performance, through scholarship, through through art. Um, the more opportunities we have to allow for this unsettling. And that unsettling for me gives, makes room for transformation. Well, thank you all so much. Thaddeus, Eto, Brian, this was a great conversation. It has me vibrating for the rest of the day. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm so excited that you guys were able to have conversation together and we were able to listen to it. 
Have a great day, everyone. And we hope to do this again. Take care. All right. Thanks, Thank y'all. I'll Thank see y'all. Thank you. Have a good one. Right. Be good. Bye. Thank you so much. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, Julian. Bye.